Uh, good morning. I'm going to call our governance and priority committee meeting to order of Tuesday, November 1st. We have an agenda in front of us. Mr. Coleman, are there any additions or deletions? Nothing from administration, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Someone want to move as presented? Councilor Lewis, thank you very much. Comments, questions? All in favor? Unanimous. We have uh, minutes of our October 4th, 2022 governance priority meeting. Looking for someone to move those. Councillor Wanchuk, thank you very much. Any questions, comments? Seeing no one, all in favor? That is unanimous. Moving on to presentations. For uh, a first presentation is from the Leduc County Library Board, and I believe uh, Councillor Smith and Mr. Honesty will be presenting. He's staying there. Okay, Mr. Honesty will be presenting, and he'll be supported by Councillor Smith, who is the okay. chair. And actually, I'll just hand it over to the chair. I'll just. Here That's, to support if there's any it. other questions. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that lead up. <laughs> Thank you for that lead up and introduction. Very kind of you. Whenever you're ready. This is an ahead. extremely important. I, I just want to give you a quick background. I, I don't spend a lot of time on the presentation. I'm just trying to reorganize what's going on there. We all know we have challenges on our boards with some of our senior members um, resigning and moving on and trying to fill the spots. And the, the library is no different as we've lost some senior members over the last couple of years and I see we're looking at renewing terms coming up and there's quite a few so I stepped in it says president on the agenda but I am in fact the chair uh, I took that position for one year just trying to reorganize and make it a little bit simpler four times a year meeting meeting the government requirements so we're under the umbrella of municipal affairs and the Leduc County Library um, distributes funds on behalf uh, you'll see that uh, for Ladue County grants, municipal affairs grants, which is distributed. Um, it's also a, a milestone that we're coming out of COVID and reopening. We did do uh, curbside pickup for books. We had small groups. Of course, we were open, we were closed. That affected staff. You're going to see some numbers where staffing has doubled. Uh, that's because we now have sta uh, staffing working before the manager would be the older one. We're seeing a good recovery. And again, working with Parks and Rec, we're seeing a lot of kids coming over after school at night times we're seeing crafts we have a, a book club so it's really going well and all of those numbers are reported within um we again we have to report to municipal fairs our numbers so those numbers came in this year they're looking healthy they're improving i'm happy to say that the board that we do have uh, reports to municipal fairs on time our annual report um, we audit uh, our own books through alberta treasury branch that's done and reported on time the Municipal Affairs Provincial Grant is distributed on time to our members, so that's going really well. And just what I'm looking for today is um, I'll just present the, quickly present the budget, and I'm looking for a motion to move it to budget deliberations later on this month. Just, um, I'll draw your attention to the spreadsheet that's up there on income, uh, Municipal County Grant. You'll see that uh, uh, we're looking a little bit... Uh, increase on a projected budget but that was because what was budgeted and what the government gave us was different so there was a 615 dollars shortfall that'll be um uh, municipal grants we receive a check from municipal affairs at which point it's divided up between the leduc beaumont calmar thorsby warburg and ourselves um, and administered through that so that goes out fundraising uh so far 24 dollars, so going really well uh, i'm really confident we can get to that 250 dollars projected but again just as time goes some of the older people that used to donate are no longer there to do that fees and fines um of course they're there they're hard to collect i hope one day we talk about fees and fines and ways of doing that because sometimes the people that use the library um don't have the means and we all forget to take stuff back maybe for us a five dollar bill isn't too much for a for a fine but for somebody else it might mean they're not going to come back and use the service um interest and gst rebate of course we get everything back on it so our total income projected budget um, other than the shortfall what was asked and what was released um, seems to balance out um, we're looking at expenses um, you can see that there's a jump in uh, just some of the staff members actually coming back in and so it looks like it's a little bit off uh, volunteers again this year we're trying to actually do something for our volunteers and to appreciate them I think it's really important and as we transition to our younger community, our people in our younger community, giving them 
asking them to step in and fill these spots and keep the library going, keep hockey going, I think, is, and keep our, our halls going is, a re, is, a, is something that the county's got to look at. We're also looking at adding money into staff courses and conference, which was never there before, but I think it's extremely important that we educate AR manager, and I'll get to that in a second, as well as our board members. Uh, they never went to anything. Um, staff mileage, books. You can see we didn't buy a lot of books during COVID, but now we're trying to definitely go through. And there's something else which uh, the library never did, which was the AV digital electronic. Uh, municipal fairs now want you to measure um, how much you're lending out in electronics. And when you don't have any, that's a problem. That just started this year. So what we've asked the library to do is to go back and ensure that they're spending their capital lines and getting the computers that they need, the iPads, the um, uh, notebooks or whatever they have for staff so they can sign them out. They also, of course, Tani was aware of, the mayor was aware of this. Uh, they had an internet given to them by TELUS, which was a hub, but they're trying to figure out how to sign it out and get it back. Um, and so maybe it's used sometimes. So th there's other areas in there that we're the, the Alberta government is going, okay, even if you're rural, you still need to do these things. You still need to measure them. So we move money into that. The audit uh, board expenses, again, I'm, I'm going to ask my board members to start charging mileage. No one ever did. And some of them live 10 kilometers away. So it's just a token, a token idea of what they're doing. Um, bookkeeping, we've increased the bookkeeper. Uh, she hasn't had a raise. And she basically, what our bookkeeper does is ensure that our financial reporting is done to municipal affairs. She ensures that the audit is prepared, done, and brought back and presented ensures that all staffing um, costs are paid for workers' compensation. So there's a little bit um, of responsibility that goes to the bookkeeper, um, which is, again, uh, oversight from the board, as well as the manager and the bookkeeper and the board work together on these payments. So there is something in place to make sure there's two signatures on everything. Uh, consulting... Uh, consulting services, $5,000. The reason we had that is there was a request to, everybody had to hire somebody with a master's degree, a master in library, uh, which was probably $130,000, $140,000 a year. And so I know Dean has been working with the government to actually throw that out. And so we put $5,000 into consult in case we need to hire somebody that has that title to allow us to function. At this point, it's not there, but that money does need to be there in case the government comes back and goes, no, you'll need to share that person with some libraries in the area. And then on the back, just banking fees, um, membership fees, postage, um, expenses, we're trying to add a little bit more into like we've had 3d printers and we've taken them out because they're so costly and so finicky and trying to separate from the school before where the school would be in trying to run on our photocopier and other things so again just trying to to get that under control and you can see grants to libraries was paid out furniture and equipment we've asked people to start doing that so we're doing some more kid-friendly areas some areas we've uh, bought a new tv we have rights to show movies some nights we're again just trying to be something in a community that really needs a place for seniors to go kids to go and and families to have events um so right now um i, I believe the ask is going to be let me just have a look and before i do that I may have to just come back to it in the figure. I have to find the number maybe on another sheet. In, uh, oh, I, I think Mr. Honesty might be there. Yeah, okay. just, just thank you. I just want to clarify this shows kind of a, a year to date. What we'll have to follow up with was, was what the actual 2023 request and the 2023 budget uh, includes. So I, I have that information. So I've inserted that into my parks and recreation budget. Um, and then we'll have to follow up with exactly what the request is from the library board for 2023. Um, okay. Any questions for Dean on this? Go ahead, Councilor Lewis. Thank you, Dean. Do you know what the um, the provincial government for the municipal affairs grant is to other municipalities? It's based on a, a per capita allocation. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> and 
It hasn't changed for several, several years. Um, but uh, but each municipality has received that based on a per capita percentage. It may change slightly based on the density of the populations, but it's somewhat similar. All right. So I am prepared to tell you that 2022 budget was 46280 we have a budget request for 2023 of 49,510, which is an increase of $3,230. One of the reasons that's there is because in the budget, I have put in a staff increase of 3%, which is not approved, but it was a move to put it in. So that can come back out and that's basically where the increase lies. If the county um, during budget deliberations decides uh, that they want to do any kind of a raise, the library will reflect that same amount. But for now, we have a 3% raise in. If that doesn't, if the county doesn't give raises this year, then it will be pretty much the same amount. So I need a motion today to uh, request for um, $49,510 for the 2023 Leduc County Library budget and forward that to budget deliberations in November. And Dean, I have this, I'll print it right now. And okay. I Thank you. I have a question from Councillor Blazer. Yeah, Rick, before we get into making that motion, I just got a question going back to books purchase. Um, I'm kind of out of the loop as far as digital and books, but is books the big thing anymore? Is digital electronic? Are we spending money on books or we maybe could be spending on the other end? Or am I wrong in this? I no, and, and books, again, uh, we talked about books. Books are still super important to what they're doing. And because of the increase of them, they're continuing to do it. But now the Alberta government is realizing that we need to get into tech and we need to make sure that we're purchasing the computers. And we have the internet and the TV and the audio visual and being able to to offer conferencing and, and put that. So right now, $8,000, we did have that discussion. Um, and it, it, it's still appropriate. It may change, Glenn, and that money wouldn't be dropped. It would just be moved into the other areas that the you know that we're moving into, which is technology with a lot of it. Um, a funny one you should ask is we used to call them magazines and periodicals. <laughs> We no longer buy magazines or pay for the periodicals. And that used to be the big thing mm -hmm. where now technology has taken that over. So that, uh, that addresses that. Thanks for that question. Okay. So do we have a motion? Council Smith, did you make a motion? You're looking for someone to oh, make that motion. Yes. Okay. I, I'd be pleased to move the request from the library board to budget deliberations. I'm not sure if that's appropriate enough or. Yeah. Yep. It has the number in there. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you, Ms. Gavin. The amount of 49,510 to 2023 budget deliberations. Okay, go ahead. That's, uh, it was, what did you say, but it's pretty, was it 5,000? That is what we've been putting in before. I think it's about 46. Just 46, 280 is what I'd written down. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, yeah. 3,000. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, motion on the floor to refer that, that to budget. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Mr. Honesty, on to your next one, which I believe is the Canadian Energy Museum. Come forward, Justin. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to uh, see you all in person and put uh, faces to names. Uh, not used to counties having councils and mayors, so this is kind of new for me. Um, a little about myself. My name is Justin Williams. Uh, originally, I'm from Ottawa, uh, and I've traveled kind of around the country, uh, living in different places and working in museums. That is my background. I have a degree in history and also a degree in museum studies. Uh, and I've worked in not-for-profit museums and uh, national museums as well. So um, I am, uh, I think, uh, in a good position to help lead this uh, museum. Uh, and uh, I took over uh, in uh, middle or towards the end of July. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of see here, um, I haven't been able to work on any uh, reporting or anything, but uh, not like our museum mission will change. Um, so as you can see, 
uh, our real focus now is to still continue that changeover from really focusing on just oil energy to all energy that is in uh, Canada. I come from Ontario where we use hydro. And I found when I say the word hydro here, people give me a blank stare and be like, <laughs> what are you talking about? And so there's that uh, fun, you know, in spirit where we can talk about all forms of energy, not just eliminating oil, because that's a huge important and it's used all around the world. It's not going anywhere. So uh, when we say we want to update stuff within the museum, it's incorporating all forms of energy, not eliminating one and Great. focusing just on renewable um, and also focusing on how it has impacted Alberta's history. So we're not just, you know, concentrating on all of Canada, but they're, you know, still concentrating on what impacts people here and many of our visitors, which are local or from the area or the province. So 2022, uh, like I said, I came kind of halfway through. Uh, we had two summer students uh, along with uh, three uh, full-time staff. Uh, we are now, I say a team of three, we're really two and a half as we have one part-timer who uh, kept on but is still in school and the uh, program coordinator and myself. We lost our facilities manager and collections manager. So we are in the hunt to look for those positions as making sure our facility still stays up and standing and in working order to allow visitors uh, and then making sure that our collection uh, is well taken care of because we are a museum first and foremost. So having someone trained and able in conservation uh, other than myself, because I, <laughs> I have many different hats. So uh, making sure that our artifacts are well taken care of and looked after and we're able to reintroduce and change up exhibits, write up text panels, stuff like that uh, is really important for a museum to keep you know new, have new special exhibits uh, we are uh, looking to grow our board. Uh, we're reaching out. Uh, we have our AGM tomorrow, so we are looking to vote in two new board members, and we're looking uh, for more members to join from different areas of the community so that uh, we can get a better understanding of uh, what they think, uh, you know, help grow and show support of the museum. Uh, we have expanded and created brand new programs for school groups and virtual uh, our virtual tours will allow us to uh, go across Canada. Uh, we have interested teachers uh, in Ontario and Nova Scotia taking part in our virtual tours in the new year. Uh, we've had both in-person and virtual tours already this new school year with more coming uh, in November uh, and then before the Christmas break. Uh, we have also expanded our summer camps and we just had a very successful Halloween events uh, where we had over 80 participants come uh, over and uh, we're really trying to push that community events, community involvement. Uh, that was one of my uh, specialties uh, in other museums. And uh, it's a really important, especially for community and not-for-profit museum is to really connect with the community. Uh, so how do we do those events? And I felt that that was uh, in years past, a little bit of a, a lack. So it's really been a big push and we uh, have just finished planning for our Christmas events. So. Really looking forward to that. We opened our women in the industry uh, and that will be moved uh, into the part of the permanent gallery. Uh, that was a story that wasn't really told in the gallery before. And uh, we we're always constantly looking for grants. We have received some, not received some, but uh, that's always the life of a community museum is you apply for grants and cross your fingers and hope that you fit what they're looking for. Uh, so going forward, uh, Going into my first full year, uh, really the the big portion is to try and find more uh, financial sustainability, uh, looking at new projects, looking at new um, grants, uh, asking governments uh, for support, and that will enable us to help continue, you know, redo exhibits, plan bigger events that we can have more people at, uh, you know, make it uh, free events so that we don't have to ask for money, especially when we want to incorporate all the community. Uh, growing vis visitorship, especially coming out of COVID this year, uh, obviously the numbers have been much higher than last year, but we want to continue that growth, uh, continue that community involvement, not just in Devon, but Leduc, Niskew, Edmonton, uh, you know, how far of our reach can we go? That's what we want to explore, especially with a new marketing strategy. Uh, organizing and we're updating our collection storage. So we're going to get new uh, 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 storage museum quality um, 
rolling racks is what we call them. So we're very excited to have those installed uh, and continue with our uh, board succession. So uh, these are some of the uh, expenses and revenues that we project. Uh, like I said, I've come in halfway through. I've noticed some things that, uh, I, you know, you kind of question why museums would do something. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, like I said, I come from a background of museums and I went to school for this. It's still kind of a new thing. There are only about six schools in Canada that offer a museum specific, uh, either major, masters or entire program. So it's still fairly new. When I tell people that I went to school for that, they kind of question me like, really? You paid money for that? So, <laughs> uh, but there is an industry. It's a huge industry. Uh, and uh, a lot of people would either go over to the UK, which is the kind of world leader for, for master's programs. But uh, I went to the oldest museum program in Canada uh, that is uh, going to celebrate its 50th anniversary next year. So uh, it, it's not a new program. It's not a new thing. It's been around for a while. Uh, so a lot of our uh, biggest uh, money uh, that we have to spend money on are either, uh, of course, uh, salaries and also keeping the museum running. So electricity, uh, gas, waste collection, uh, all of this stuff, uh, making sure that our AC and heat works as these units are a little bit on the older side. So making sure the proper people come up and make sure they go as long as they can is uh, kind of where our biggest expense uh, we think going forward. Uh, in our revenue, uh, we had a great year for revenue. We're over 3,000 visitors this year. Uh, actually, we'll be over 3,500. I don't know if we'll get to 4,000. Depends on how many field trips we're able to squeeze in before the Christmas break. Um, but we've exceeded expectations with our campground, with our gift shop, um, with our lease and rentals. And that's looking like it's going to increase uh, into the new year uh, as more and more people book and rent the space and see what, you know, the bargain that they get best bang for their buck. We expect more and more people to come out and have rentals and celebrations. We've had a few celebrations of life, birthday parties, along with corporate rentals. So uh, I hope the word is spreading. That's the best way of marketing word of mouth. So uh, we hope to continue in that and push for more donations uh, along with the other stuff that doesn't really change like land leases, uh, rentals, and uh, always looking for new projects uh, maybe that we can do in the future to get more money. And then of course, grants. <laughs> So like I said, operational costs, payroll and utilities are our largest expense. We are uh, hoping to get in and our costs down on uh, by in installing stuff like uh, solar. Um, but with a staff of two and a half, that's not yep. going to happen overnight. Uh, so that is a long term project. But getting grants uh, that focus in on that will help us achieve that a lot sooner. Uh, municipal Municipal support is massive. Like I said, a community really helps invigorate a space like a museum. We want to be uh, like the library. Uh, we want to be a hub for the community, a space where they can come and uh, explore, learn, uh, attend events, uh, incorporate, be incorporated into the uh, museum itself uh, and sponsorships and partners. We are launching a big sponsorship package uh, starting next year to go after uh, not just companies in the oil industry, but uh, all industries that the museum covers uh, because we want to tell the entire energy story. Whereas uh, in the past, it's just been focused on one industry. And I think that was uh, a little bit of a, gotta grow so we can do that. Uh, so there are more of it. So creation of new fundraising events. Uh, we have an idea for a, a massive fundraiser in the spring. Uh, marketing to schools and programs across Canada, not just in the province. Uh, looking for new grants that we uh, might have not known about in the future. Uh, it's always can be someone's full-time job in a big organization museum. There is people who are sole job is just to look for those stuff. So uh, you got to be able to time out 
your, uh, your workday specifically uh, and campsite upkeep and popularity is very, very popular. We still have about seven or eight trailers there, even though it closed yesterday. <laughs> so uh, people have fell in love with camping and RVing again. So we want to help uh, boost that for next year as well and make sure that it's up to standard and not, uh, not going to break down halfway through the season. Um, so uh, our requests, we are requesting $25,000 from uh, the county. Uh, the city of Leduc is providing us with $25,000 on a three-year term. We have asked the town of Devon uh, for $12,500. I uh, have not heard anything uh, on that request. Um, again, this will allow us to uh, continue uh, to work towards uh, sustainability, both uh, operational and uh, revenue, help us increase change up things within the museum, which will add visitorship and uh, also help with marketing as uh, a lot of people drive by. I've heard someone say I've driven by for 30 years and I never stopped in. Finally, I decided to today. And we get a lot of those stories and it's not um, alone just to this museum. A lot of community museums that I've worked in, I've heard the exact same sentiment, but also that word of mouth. Hey, I had a really great time. We're going to, uh, you know, I'm going to spread the word or next time my relatives come and visit, I'm going to take them here. Uh, so we got to work on that and uh, just find a way to build that into uh, more than just word of mouth and uh, assisting with payroll so that we can uh, make sure that our facility manager and collections manager are paid a fair wage. That has been a big thing in the industry is uh, a livable wage. If your position does not have a livable wage, many uh, sites like the Canadian Museum Association, any emerging professionals will not broadcast your job ad because that was a huge thing in the industry for decades. And uh, so they want to change that. And uh, I support that. So <laughs> got to make sure people uh, are willing and able. Um, and, uh, you know, I might be new to the area, but uh, many of you have been here for for many years or ever. So, uh, you know, creating that community presence, uh, the educational opportunities, uh, strengthen volunteers, get that connection, uh, community, a gathering spot, uh, helping build tourism to the region. Uh, how do we grow that? Uh, and not only is it a unique uh, place where history took place, uh, but it is now going into the next phase of its life where uh, it can be a uh, another jumping off point for history and uh, for the community and visitors uh, in itself. So thank you, and any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, some questions. Remember, Justin's only been here half a year. Go ahead, Council Blaza. Yeah, this is more a comment than a question. Um, I gotta say for, for me this past summer, it was kind of a busy one, but the wife and I did take a day no. and we did go to your museum. And, and for uh, my wife was born and raised right around the area, and, and you're right, was never there. She was quite amazed at what she seen. and. So we, we told our sons about it, who both work in the oil industry and NISQ were never there. They toured it this summer. So you, your words of uh, promoting this to the kids, to me is very important because they're gonna tell people like my wife and my sons about this. And, and I think from there, the, the word of mouth can really expand. As it, it, it's a fantastic place to be or, or to, to visit. And like I said, my wife was just impressed. So I thank you for that. And I'll leave it at that, thanks. Oh. Thank you. Endorsement right here at the council table for your museum. Um, I, I'm actually quite surprised at the number, um, I, what you made for admissions this year, considering the very confusing um, construction that's happening outside of there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because I'm not sure if it was the previous or the previous, previous um, manager there had wanted to close down the campground. And that would have been a significant loss. I don't know what the cost is to manage that campground, but it is bringing in $40,000 or project projected to. So I think it's a bit of balancing both. And you're right, you're, you're doing a lot of, a lot of work um, on a lot of places, um, but certainly is something that uh, I think most people in the Duke County really, really appreciate having, even if we haven't been there. Any further questions, Councillor Lewis? Just a question on your farmhouse rental. Is that actually a, like a residence? 
that's rented? Yeah, so uh, a family does uh, live there. Uh, it's a very unique museum, whereas um, not many museums in Canada operate a campground, yeah. uh, you know, hold lease for a, um, a safety company that does training uh, and has a, a literal residence on site. Um, so acting as a, you know, a tenant, a landlord, uh, a camp manager is definitely a unique one in Canada. Um, so yes, a, a family does, uh, live there currently. Um, and, uh, yeah, they have a horse. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, uh, we don't make budget decisions and I'm sure you've heard that from uh, Mr. Honesty here. So I'm looking for someone to refer the request from the Canadian Energy Museum. Uh, to budget deliberations. Councillor Belazer will make that motion. Okay. I'm not seeing any further questions. The motion is on the floor. I'm going to call the question. All in favor? It's unanimous. Nice to meet you. Um, nice and to meet you. <laughs> hope to have an event for us out there and we'll show up and re experience the museum with you. Yes, definitely. Because <laughs> I think, Dean, you and I want to some contest last time we were there, if I recall correctly. Usually, making a pipeline or something. usually if we're partnered together, we, we always will be victorious yes, for that's sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> See, we remember that. <laughs> Just to clarify, for Council, yes. we've already submitted this as part of the it's already in sponsor. There. Okay, correct. absolutely. Okay, thank you. On to uh, 4C, which is our presentation related to um, growth forecasts and land. Uh, analysis and is this virtual? Nope, yes, YouTube. It is. it is virtual. That's that was the noise I heard. <laughs> okay, all right. So we'll give a moment to set up and then we'll get started. And you'll lead us off, Ms. Johnson. Um, as you're aware, on September 6th, uh, and your, your microphone's not on there. That's okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> so on September 6, Kirpeet and Darrow of Applications Management were here. At that time, they provided an overview of the population and employment forecast for the county to 2050. So today they're um, going to be, of course, joining us by Zoom to provide an overview of the land requirements to support that population and employment forecasts. And um, I know when we were were here last, there was some some questions and and whatnot that uh, the committee members had asked us to to take a look at, and Gurpreet and Daryl did that, and so of course they'll also be providing a summary of the forecasts just to remind you uh, what they were, and there has been some adjustments made to those based on the feedback we've received at the last meeting. So with that, if um, Daryl and Gurpreet are now with us. Um, they can go ahead and proceed. Okay. Thank you, Lori. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me. You are good, thank you. Okay. And I'm just gonna share my screen here. So you can see my screen. Very small. Um, so just to provide an update, um, as, as Lori mentioned, um, the last time we were here, um, we did um, provide an overview of the population and employment growth forecast that we provided for the Leduc subregion and Leduc County. Um, there were some questions, as Lori pointed out, in regards to uh, some of the distribution of growth. Um, and so we did take a look at that and we did... Um, provide an update to uh, the employment forecast for Leduc County. Um, so um, in aggregate, um, you know, in the low scenario, we're assuming that the pop or the employment is going to grow to 23,334. Um, in the medium scenario, it's 28,369. And in the high scenario, it's 31,429. Um, and compared to what uh, we had reviewed with you last time, that's an increase of about a thousand additional jobs. Um, and that comes out of, um, there was a couple uh, comments raised around, um, you know, looking at increased opportunities as a result of access based off of the, the spine road. Um, and so we did take a look at that. Um, and so in terms of um, um, adding additional employment, um, we did add that employment to, specifically to uh, the three areas within NISCU, 
Um, so employment increased within North NISCU, Central NISCU, and South NISCU. Um, and that was employment that was redistributed from other parts of the Leduc subregion as a result of that. Um, and then in other areas, uh, specifically um, Genesee, uh, while that did come up, we didn't specifically um, add additional jobs to Genesee, although we do think that there is potential opportunity for uh, employment to be located there. And I think some of that employment could come from other parts of the county. Uh, but we didn't make a specific assumption of in, in these forecasts as to what that type of employment would be. So overall, the employment in, increased in this update compared to the last time of about 1,000 jobs. Um, in terms of uh, population, uh, so the population uh, forecast that you see before you are the same as the, the, time that, the last time we looked at it. Um, so in terms of overall population, just as an update, um, in the low scenario, we're assuming that the county will grow to uh, just under 17,500, which is an average annual growth rate of 0.7%. Um, in the medium, um, we're assuming it would grow to 21,030, which is about 1.3% average annual growth rate. And in the high scenario, we're assuming it's going to grow to 22,591, which is an average annual growth rate of 1.6%. Um, as you can see here, you know, there has been growth that's been allocated to different parts of the county, um, including country residential, lakeshore. Um, but of course, most of the growth um, that we've assumed over this time frame has been allocated to East Vistas, uh, which is the urban node within the county. Gurpreet, could I ask a question yeah. now? Yeah, definitely. One of the things, the county's been working really hard um, investing in new Sarepta with infrastructure, uh, roads, sidewalks, water, wastewater. And, and it's not, it's not, well, it's not sort of coming up as much. What are we missing there? Is it, is it, do we need to look back at the employment and say, how do we get um, some kind of large employment node in new Sarepta? Or do you have any ideas on that? Thank you. Yeah, are you thinking in terms of uh, just not seeing enough growth within New Sarepta? Well, yeah, because yeah, if you look at the if you look at the numbers, I mean, in twenty six years, the low one is is very small growth, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, we've we've been making it, we've been, for lack of a better term, we've been you know investing in that infrastructure that was allowed to slip when it was a um, a village, a standalone village as a growth hamlet we call it our growth hamlet and it is looking better it is the roads are great the sidewalks good we got a great school there we've got a rec center there we just don't have a lot of people there and so what is it that we're missing or really i mean maybe that's you're not the right person to ask that question to but um how do we how do we encourage that growth out there and if you say not not my bailiwick and I'm not the the person with the oracle and the crystal ball, I'll turn that over to our county manager. <laughs> yeah, well, and I might uh, pass that on to Daryl. Daryl okay. may have further insight into that okay. as well. Well, certainly, yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, certainly, some um, location of jobs in the immediate okay. vicinity yeah. would uh, be a significant benefit to promoting growth. But I think one of the things that uh, you appreciate is that there's lots of residential location options in the subregion. And okay. so it has to, I think probably if it got to a critical mass and uh, had some of the same kinds of amenities that other of those uh, residential location options had, you would see a, a higher rate of, a higher total amount of growth. The rate of growth is actually pretty high, but you're right, it's starting from a small base. But uh, some employment activity there would be a significant boost to the population forecast. Absolutely. That's kind of what I was thinking as well. Thank you. Okay. So in terms of the land requirements, so we did do an analysis to take a look at uh, what the requirements for land would be based off of our uh, residential and non-residential forecasts. Um, so on the residential side, um, again, for all of the same geographies within the county, um, we made a projection of what the land requirements would be within the low, medium, and high scenario. Um, and so um, the, the range um, over the, that almost 30-year time horizon is uh, 400, 
541 uh, gross developable hectares um, in the low scenario, uh, 1,278 uh, gross developable hectares in the medium scenario, and 1,528 gross developable hectares in the high scenario. Um, and of course, you can see the distribution uh, of those hectares. I'll just, uh, we, have, we do have a map in here as well. Um, so you can see um, um, each of these different areas, the, the land requirements have been um, based off of assumptions of, um, you know, how many units per hectare uh, would be assumed based off of the plan. So in the case of East Vistas, it is based off of the, the ASP in terms of the number of units per hectare that the ASP is, is um, assuming. Um, in terms of new Sarepta, we've based this off of a density uh, based off of, as you mentioned, um, you know, the EMRB assumes new Sarepta to be a growth hamlet. Um, and in there, um, the density target is 20 units per hectare. So we've assumed that for new Sarepta in terms of calculating the land requirements. Um, on the lakeshore side, we've taken densities based off of an average from uh, Pigeon, Pigeon Lake and Wizard Lake ASPs. Um, to come up with what the land requirements would be. Um, and then in terms of the country residential, um, you know, we haven't outlined exactly where this growth necessarily would be, but we are assuming that there would be various locations within the county where, where that uh, uh, country residential land use is, is designated for that type of development, um, where that range of 410 to 1126 hectares could be accommodated within the county. On the non-residential side, uh, similarly, we took the uh, employment forecast that we've uh, developed uh, for the county by each of these areas by industry, um, and we convert those into uh, land requirements uh, for commercial and industrial land requirements. Um, and then for each of the areas we're, we're um, highlighting here, um, kind of what the range would be in terms of uh, the amount of gross developable land that would be required. Um, and I mention a range just because um, within each of those, um, you know, um, I guess densities by industry and by commercial and industrial, we do have a range in terms of, um, you know, the number of jobs per hectare that could be accommodated. And that range is often based off of, you know, um, the assumption that it's really going to be dependent on the type of um, businesses that might be located there. And so that's why we have a lower and upper range for, for each of these three um, growth scenarios. Um, in total, the range for the county assumes that there would be uh, between 224 on the lower end uh, hectares that would be required. And on the higher end in the high scenario, it would be 690 hectares. Um, in terms of the distribution of that growth, again, um, NISCU, of course, has... Um, you know, if you look at NISCU and aggregate between North Central and South NISCU, um, there's land required between 128 and 410 hectares. Um, and we have assumed that um, some of the development that would be accommodated within net, net Central NISCU um, would, uh, would assume that there would be intensification of some of the land, uh, redevelopment and intensification of some of the maybe lower density uh, land that's within Central NISCU. Um, and then in terms of the agricultural hub that was proposed at Highway 39 and 60, again, we have a range of between 10 and 30 hectares, um, depending again upon um, the amount of economic activity that would happen there across those three scenarios. So I'm just gonna pause there. Um, that kind of gives you an overview of the residential and the non-residential land requirements. So I'll pause for some questions. Okay, looking for questions. Uh, I have a question for administration uh, right now. I appreciate the comment on Central NISCU. We are rezoning for redensification. Is that correct? So that that should come to fruition, moving us to the higher le uh, level. That's correct, Madam Chair. So the Central NISCU redevelopment plan is currently under development. Um, driving purpose of that plan is to accommodate redevelopment of lower intensity lands. Okay. Thank you. What... I guess I, I I wonder what does it what would it take um, or would it just take one large um, redevelopment in any of these areas to actually skew the numbers? So let's say um, 
Amazon decides that they're going to put a second automated um, distribution facility here in Ladue County, and they want to put it in uh, south of Devon. How are the are the is that what it would take to actually push things forward faster? Some some type of an investment like that. To anyone who'd like to answer that. <laughs> so yeah, with that we we did speak with uh, Gurpreet and and Daryl. So these assumptions are based on what we know today. Correct. So if there is some proposals that come forward, and there's still some question about exactly what the rate of growth will be around um, East Vistas. So right. we know we can accommodate the growth, but exactly where that growth is going to occur, we're basing it on the assumptions made today. Those could definitely change with different um, proposals that are brought forward. A game changer we're coming in. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Evans. I would just add that in the planning process, this will give us an idea of what we would generally expect to be our growth trends over time. And we can compare that to what we have in terms of our overall land supply designated in our municipal development plan and other plans. And that'll give us uh, an idea of, of um, we can do some sensitivity analysis around that. So if we see a major development, where does that put us? If we're a little bit lower than the numbers suggest, where does that put us? Just gives us a better idea of what we have, what we can expect, and what we would need in certain scenarios. Thanks. Um, I have a, a second question. I don't see any other hands up. How how does our growth projections and or need for land and employment, how is that impacted or does it impact our neighbors like Beaumont and the city of Edmonton and the city of Leduc? Or how do we how do we manage our planning through that, knowing that all that they have growth aspirations as well? So, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So we've looked at that as well. Gurpreet and Daryl had a look at that. And these, these forecasts are what we can reasonably expect in our subregion. So they've looked at what could be reasonably expected in the city of Leduc, Beaumont. And um, so based on that, that's these forecasts are based on what we as Leduc okay. County can reasonably expect. And we'll always be impacted and will impact our neighbors in the region. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? I am seeing none. Repreach back to you. Okay. I think, I mean, from our end, I think that's the end of our presentation. Um, I think that we, um, yeah, we just wanted to be able to present the update to the growth forecasts um, and then also what these land requirements are. Um, I think, I don't know, Lori, in terms of the process, if there's any other additional questions, you can definitely share those with us. Okay. So no additional questions, um, um, but I will say we will use this information, of course, um, as we review the MDP, we have that update that's scheduled and um, we will take a further uh, look at the land requirements, the forecasts, and then of course, um, all the, the de uh, designations of land within the MDP and of course, bring that back to you uh, through that process. Will, these, will this information also inform our submission to EMRB on the growth plan update, or is that a different process? <clears throat> uh, yeah, so as In we work through the uh, growth plan update, this gives us the information we need to okay. have those discussions with, uh, with uh, the board administration there. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daryl and Gurpreet, for your work on this and um, your presentation today. We appreciate it. Um, we know there'll be growth. This helps us to plan and where to expect it and know where we actually have some opportunities for other growth as well. So greatly appreciate your time today. And I'm looking for someone to move this as information. Councillor Belazer, thank you very much. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, on to 5A, uh, which is our economic development update. Welcome back, Mr. White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of council and those that are in attendance. Uh, 
This report is in regards to the um, uh, economic development update for Leduc County. And it is administration's recommendation that the Governance and Priorities Committee receive the economic development update report as information. This committee also has options to receive this report as information or to provide another direction. So administration is providing this monthly update to council on Leduc County's economic development activities for the month of October. For some background, Leduc County's economic development operations align with council's strategic vision and expectations through the strategic plan. Some of those activities include an investment strategy, increasing the non-residential tax base, creating a business center, and promoting agriculture producers. For recent activities in regards to the Duke Business and Entrepreneur Center, also was known as the Recreation Center, the team has moved, the economic development team has moved into this building. Renovations Ooh. are complete. Wow. The Prairie Scan Federal Funding Reporting has been submitted on time. And we meet with them very regularly to ensure that their expectations are being met. Mr. White, is there, if I may, is there a chance that we could get a quick tour at some point if you're moved in? And I will uh, answer that question just shortly okay. uh, as I finish my paragraph. And it looks like you want to cut him off or have a ribbon cutting. I'm not well, sure I would what assume. you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think I was reading you quite That's well. That's exciting. Um, anyway, administrations, as mentioned, focused on meeting those expectations for the grant funding that we were so lucky to get. Um, we are focusing on attracting building operators and programming providers. Uh, furniture has been ordered, uh, cleaning is being uh, done, and we expect all that to be completed by uh, November 2022. Um, we expect the business support activities to be operational before the year's end, and we're hoping to have an open house anticipated in early December 2022. From the customer relations management system that we've uh, purchased, uh, that is called Salesforce. It is expected to be fully operational by uh, early December, and I'm hoping even by mid mid November. Um, this business solution will allow us to track our activities, also to track contacts, and also provide us some analytics and performance measurements and outcomes. The business retention and expansion program. We've completed the business retention and expansion program survey. A summary report comprised of Leduc County businesses' responses is expected uh, this month and will support the future business support work. Council will be briefed on the report's findings, and our basic focus is to ensure that our local businesses can find ways to remove barriers to expansion and also ensure that they're staying, uh, staying put. The Leduc County Investment Strategy on October 25th, Dirty Council Workshop, our senior advisor, Bob Murray, presented the Leduc County Investment Strategy and took some of council's initial thoughts and that uh, we had before moving for a strategy for formal approval of council. And I see there was a question from uh, ahead, yeah. sir. a question to Mr. Coleman. Will um, the Ladue County investment strategy be something that you're looking at incorporating into the budget process this year, or do you see the need for further approval before we start to use it? I mean, there's elements that are going on already. So there's elements that are incorporated into the budget. Uh, there'll be a formal approval process, obviously, of the plan itself. But Okay. And just to follow up, I, again, what I had a chance to go over and see, I found it a very targeted uh, initiative and looking forward to moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so once again, we took uh, council's uh, comments and recommendations, and that will be reflected in the final version of the uh, strategy for council's consideration. Um, the investment strategy is the key framework for our work plans and our actions for the economic development group. And we will be incorporating some um, touch points uh, as we just saw with the growth threat strategy that was just pre presented and making sure that we are uh, looking at those uh, uh, analytics and how we incorporate our work as well on those growth areas. From regional engagement, administration continues to work with new investors and developers to facilitate new investment in the county. Administration continues to be an engaged member with the Collaborative Economic Development and Edmonton Global, and we continue to reach out to our partners and build relationships. Uh, this is based on council's strategic outcomes to raise awareness for Leduc County priorities. And that so sums up my uh, presentation. I'm available. Uh, administration is to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Lewis. No questions, just a comment. I've been out tooting around, having conversations with people, and there's many people that have said, I've, I've reached out to Brad. Brad's been great. Um, I've oh. been in contact. I've had meetings. So it, it's nice to hear that you're out there getting stuff done. So I just wanted to make Thank that. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Um, are we, is there anything that we're looking at when we talk about, and I'm going down to the last one, collaborative economic development or regional engagement, are we in discussions with our regional sub, well, I'm just going to say our sub, the sub region with any kind of partners around any other investments that we might be doing jointly or we're just keeping each other in the loop? So, Madam Chair, I can tell you that I am a member of pretty much every group <laughs> that's on the collaborative economic development since its inception. Um, I can tell you that I would say moving forward, the, the province bel believes that this is a potential opportunity that they can also be involved in as they committed to half a million dollars to the, the group to yeah. Uh, yeah. look down the road. We've also had conversations <laughs> with ministers and different uh, ministries uh, in regard to what is the art of the possible. And I would suggest moving forward, the first pilot projects you will likely see off the table will likely be of a sub sub-regional variety where it'll be one or two or three municipalities. And I can assure you that uh, I'm making sure that the Leduc County is well represented. And I, that's good to hear. My, my fear was that we were going to reinvent a shared investment for shared benefit framework. We now have two that sit in the in the region, one from the airport accord and one from the EMRB table. Um, and my fear was we were going to use that money to create yes, yet a third one, because I think there's enough an expertise in those two frameworks now that um, if there is the willing to the will to do it, there's enough pieces out of those that would make a, a, a great framework to work through. And if I may, um, Madam Chair, um, the shared investment, shared benefit has that component of this may be something that we build as a region right. where you may not see a return on investment, Correct. where this one is expected to have a return on investment yeah. for the partners that are voluntary right. at the beginning, middle and end. Yeah. And again, it's sometimes it's not um, monetary. It might be jobs that we're creating. And I know that that was um, a lot of the conversation. So glad to know that we're looking at projects not creating something new. And we'll be speaking to that at our next oversight committee meeting, whenever that is. Any further questions? Looking forward to the invitation to the ribbon cutting and uh, the tour. So looking forward to that. So someone want to move this as information. If there's no further questions, Councillor Wanchuk, thank you. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. On to Mr. Bain, notice of Alberta Utilities Commission hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. You've got a brief report on this in your package. Um, County administration recently received formal notification from the Alberta Utilities Commission that the Creekside Solar um, Inc., which is uh, associated with the Volterix Group, has filed their application with the AUC for their solar project south of Calmar. And so the, the application is for uh, the construction operation of an 18.4 megawatt solar uh, installation uh, known as the Creekside Solar Project. And so the commission's letter indicates that parties may, rich, may uh, wish to register to participate in the AUC process. Um, there's a little bit of information in the report here, Madam Chair, around the development side of this. And so administration has previously given some information to members of council around what that is. Um, essentially, um, these kinds of developments are not exempt from municipal planning regulations, but the AUC approval prevail, prevails over those decisions. So in essence, if the AUC approves any development that it regulates, um, the municipality would be compelled to essentially through its development authority issue a development permit for that upon application. So that's sort of how that works. Um, the, the opportunity still remains if Leduc County so wishes to participate in the AUC proceedings, there would uh, ultimately be a hearing that would be uh, presided over by the commission. The date for that is not yet set. There's some detail provided on the last page of the letter around the steps and the timing of those steps leading up to that point. Um, and, and of course, indicating the date for the hearing is not yet set. Um, we have a little bit of time to decide whether a council wishes to engage in that process. And we'd have to register essentially an intention to do that by the 14th of November. So the question here, Madam Chair, is um, does the committee wish administration to, to um, start down that process and, and register that intention and, and proceed accordingly? Thank you, Councillor Smith. 
Thank you for that. I just want to provide a little bit of history of where we have participated before. Um, we had power line, a request to run power lines from Beaumont down to the east end of the county. It would have ran down 625, 504 Joe Lake Road over to uh, the subdivision. We did agree as a, count, as a council to represent the uh, Ladue County views. And that was problem with development, problem with intersections, a better route was Highway 14. If Ladue County has anything that goes against this, um, I guess, application, which is the use of farmland, then I do believe we need to at least make a presentation that states our policy and would state uh, whether we are for or against it within that policy. So I'd be supportive of representing Leduc County views that are, are in policy, targeted, and making a presentation um, because we do need to... I believe protect our views, um, but we also need to express our views that are in policy and the will of Ladue County Council. So I'd be in support of participating in this hearing. Is that a motion, sir? Yes. Could, okay. okay. As long as we have a little bit more debate. Here, yes, of course. You can put the motion on the floor. And so there's a motion on the floor to participate as intervener in the process. Councillor Belazer. Yeah. Um, as far as Leduc County um, participating is one thing, are residents of Leduc County allowed to participate or is this, is the county gonna be their representatives? Madam Chair, any individual can participate. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lewis. Uh, I'm on the same page as Councillor Smith. As, as long as we stick to what are, what's in our plans and our policies, uh, then I would be on board for that, thank you. Um, I uh, will say that I will recuse myself from the vote. I have uh, in the past showed a bias um, in this uh, topic. And so I believe in the, I don't know what you say, the best best use of, of reputation and ensuring that I'm not uh, creating any kind of further bias. I will recuse myself for the vote. I will sit here. I will manage the debate and do all that piece, but I will not be voting on this. Any further comments or questions? Councillor uh, Scobie. I guess just a question. If we oppose this in any way, does that come into a, any kind of a problem with, we're, we're forced to give them development permits afterwards, but if we go to a hearing opposing it on the, you know, using ag land or whatever, does that put us in any kind of a position for uh, issuing development permits after? Madam Chair, I would say it doesn't. Um, and the, so the report, the staff report you have here actually speaks to this. It's it's pretty important that if council wishes to register concerns or perspective period on the proposal through the AUC pr process, that would be distinct and separate from what the development authority's job here actually is. So the development authority has a statutory obligation to deal with a process that's separate and distinct from any political considerations. So when the decision's made, if the decision's yes, we work ahead with the development permits like we always would. Correct. Yeah. Councilor Smith. This process is a gathering of a lot of information and I do believe Ladue County needs to put in that evidence as part of the decision-making process. Thank you, Mayor, for your consideration in the matter. Um, again, there we're, I, I don't believe Ladue County's biased, but I do believe Ladue County has an obligation to state our policies and to state uh, how where we are right now with our land development. It doesn't mean we're opposing it. It means we are adding evidence of what we would like to see within the municipality. It, it's going to cost a little bit, but I think Ladue County needs to stand up. I think they need to um, notify the AUC of uh, where we stand because this probably won't be the last based on some of the things going forward. It doesn't need to be any kind of a presentation other than factual. It's evidence that will be considered and it will make um, it will make a decision in their decision to where, where to place this. So again, just restating why it's important for Leduc County to clearly state what policies uh, this might uh, intervene or else affect our development. Thank you. Further comments, questions, debate? Councillor Scobie? Just one more and it's, kind of the thing I've brought up numerous times when we talk about these things, are we able to, well, in this, in this case, you know, when we're putting in our case, uh, talk about uh, cleanup 
uh, some kind of guarantees for cleanup afterwards. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we don't end up with abandoned orphan solar farms along with uh, orphan wells. Uh, can we recommend or that we would like to see a bond or a, mm. some sort of a deal put in that we don't end up with a solar farm with a defunct company that walks away from this thing, takes the profits and slides mm. us into a dead company like the oil wells, the oil companies do. And we end up owning a solar farm that's wore out and fallen over. Madam Chair, I believe that is possible. I, I expect that council and the county could provide input into this process through the AUC's um, process and hearing on any matter it deems relevant. Uh, the other thing I would add is that there are things we can regulate through the development permit process for sure. Um, the, the bar for the development authority will be we cannot regulate something that the AUC has dealt with through their approval. But if there are aspects of the approval that the AUC um, decision does not deal with, we can actually deal with those through a development permit. So, for example, if if the AUC approval were to um, not deal with where the access is off of the municipal grid roads are to be located. We can deal with those through the DP. So there are some things we can do. We just cannot be in conflict with AUC approval. So that could be something we ask for or are concerned about raise yes. at the hearing. It can be raised at the hearing. Councilor Scobie. I just, I don't know if that's anybody else's concern on this thing, but that's what I just see with all these things. They've got a 20 year lifespan and we're going to have 46,000 solar panels to dispose of them uh, to turn this back into farmlands. So uh, I'm not sure what your thoughts on it, but I just see a, another disaster lining up. Thank you. Further comments, questions, or debate? Seeing none, going to call the question. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to my favorite part of the meeting, quarterly reports. We're just going to take a quick two-minute break uh, while you set up. Well, that changed for me. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much, uh, administration, for allowing us a quick break. On to Ms. Klamosko, who will lead us through our 2022 Q3 report. The floor thank you very much, Mayor and Council. We have our senior management team here this morning to present our quarter three 2022 reporting uh, to Council. We have a recommendation uh, for Council to accept the report and attachments as information. Uh, we do uh, quarterly reporting with Council um, to provide a progress update on our various projects and programs. So this reporting demonstrates our commitment to achieving positive results and helps foster open, transparent communication. So similar to the process that we followed in previous reporting, we will go through in the order um, that is presented within the table of contents, which was on page 56 of your agenda package. So the first item that is within the report is county highlights. So on the first page of the county highlights document, we just pull various um, work that has been completed within the various departments in the organization in quarter three and provide a highlight um, to some of that work that has been done. Are there any questions with any of the, the highlights that were provided within this page? Um, I have a question. I was unable at, uh, to attend uh, the Chamber uh, Social Awareness Luncheon. I know uh, Councillor Lewis attended as Deputy Mayor. Is it something that uh, 150 attendees was great? Is it something that we're looking at doing again or quarterly or um, building on that? Because it sounded like it looks like it was quite successful. Yes, we, um, we've planned for it uh, annually now. Okay. We're changing the theme every year, always around social awareness, but with a different theme. This year was around mental health. Next year might be a different topic. And of course, we continue to partner with the Chamber because they're a fantastic partner. Thank you. Councillor Lewis, anything to add from the event? Uh, no, it was, uh, well, okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it was great to see the turnout of so many different community-led organizations within within the, the region. Uh, great support from everyone that came out. And uh, it was noted that so many people actually visited the booths around around That's the great. room yes. for more information. So yeah. it, was, it was very impactful. Thank you. Thank you. So going to the next page of county highlights, we just have some bar graphs at the highest level uh, of the revenues and expenditures to September 30th. We go into more detail by department in the department reports. So going to the next page in the package, we have um, some real estate market activity information. Councillor Smith. Thank you for that. Again, uh, just looking at um, the residential part, uh, parcels in division one, two, and three. That's 22. That's we're looking just now at our projections for population and everything. And I was looking at them going, they might be pretty low. When you look at these, will probably end up being houses within the next year. There's 22 new lots for housing development. Add at least four people. That's 100 people in uh, in increases. So again, based on the report that we saw today on our projections in one areas one, two, three, I think we need to probably look at the top end because um, I mean 13 residential parcels in division two is all of our inventory of country residential which we talk about a lot being used up even four out in division one and five of course those would be the vista so I just want to make a comment that I think we're going to end up having a pleasant surprise of way more residents moving here mm -hmm. and with that employment it, it seems to be trending that way I would agree thank you thank you council so moving to the next page, page, page 60 of your package, we provide development highlights that are occurring um, within quarter three. So there's a whole page of development that is occurring. Um, and then the next page, page 61, just speaks to the permits and the value of the permits that we've issued to date and in quarter three um, for 2022. There's also a section with a health and safety update and some information about what's occurred within that program. And then going to page 62, uh, we have uh, whistleblower complaints. We do have a hotline set up and we've received no complaints in Q3 nor year to date. And then also speaks to our debt services limit that we have available to us in 2022. A new addition in this quarterly reporting is on page 63 of your package. So this was um, 
pulling from our 2022 to 2025 strategic plan, Council had identified some high priority strategies that um, you wanted administration to start working on immediately upon approval of your st new strategic plan. So what we've done here is provided some specific actions to date on these high priority strategies. Okay, seeing no questions, I'll move uh, to the next report in the package is our corporate plan. So again, this is... Um, Similar to what we have for all of the departments, um, a highlight to the actions that we had committed to in 2023, and then some status updates. Are there any questions on the corporate plan specifically? I don't have a question, Ms. Klamosko, but um, I do think that Council did a great job when we met with Minister Wilson, um, sharing all of the pieces from our advocacy plan uh, and being able to put those all on the table. I, I thought we did a pretty good job of keeping to that. So um, we need to get some cheat sheets for us so that we have those words right at our right at our fingertips. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that, Madam Mayor. We are working on some of those uh, fact sheets and different pieces of material that we can provide to Council so that we can be very purposeful with our advocacy moving forward. So going to moving into our departmental quarterly reports, we start with administration. So we head right into assessment, which is on page 74 of the package. So again, um, if there's any questions for the assessment department, we have their operational plan and their financial reports are the ones that... Questions for assessment. Nope. Moving forward, we next have Corporate Services Department. Again, if I move too quickly, we can absolutely go okay. back, yep. but I will just keep moving forward absolutely. unless I see yep. a hand go up for a question. So the next department is our Finance Department. And just a reminder, I think it was 2025, our next thing falls off to venture. I'd asked that question before, and I think it was something from Luma. Is that yeah, close? That's correct. 2024, 2025, our new, init our new initiative. Can you tell what I've been working on? <laughs> our local improvements do, uh, they fall off of our debenture schedule. So okay. I can't remember if it's Luma or NISQ first. Okay. Thank you. Just my, trying to manage that um, as we move forward. Okay, thank you. So the next report within the package is on page 93, and that's agricultural services. Okay. Oh, just to hang on. Okay. Uh, just a club route, better, worse, same as we've been. Do we have an idea? I, I know we talk about whether it's a wet year sometimes or a dry year. It makes a difference. Where, where were we with that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I believe in the report there's 143 yeah. Yeah. fields of the 670 some odd that were inspected, um, which is typical. We didn't have severe, severe, severe infections uh, okay. because it was so dry, um, but it's um, like we've discussed around this table at Ag Service Board. Um, if you manage this disease, um, your, your crops will tolerate it. So, so grow resistant varieties and manage your rotation. Just before you step away, um, we are getting more potato seed farmers in the in the county. Um, had a great opportunity to visit with uh, one that uh, farms out in Division Four um, on the weekend. What what's a trigger for us starting to look for diseases in other crops like potatoes, something like ring rot or something? Is there a trigger, or what does that look like from a from a municipal perspective? Yeah, so we we will only look. Um, at diseases that are on the Agricultural Pests Act, okay. right? So um, we are an extension of the province. So under the Weed Control Act, Pest Control Act, Soil Conservation Act, we will look at for those diseases that are on there. For something like potatoes, um, because they are, a, a you know, an immediate source of, of um the CFIA, um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, they inspect potatoes. Um, okay. Yeah, right. so that they're they're regulated a lot different than just what a municipality would. 
So it's federally so if, regulated. If there was some type of outbreak, would then would that be the agency that then would put in policy or inspections and not us? Correct? Yeah, hundred percent. They okay. already they already have policy, okay. and and we would be notified um, right. of what is occurring. Okay. Councillor Scobie, that's the inspections uh, when they're actually you see on the potato fields where there's a truck park there. Yeah. They got portable washrooms. They got a crew. They got yeah. Yeah. and sure. there's people roaming up and down the. Yep. Fields like they do a pretty thorough, yeah. very, very, thorough. very, very thorough. Yep. And I guess one other, yes, the 647, whatever you put in here in the report, mm -hmm. that's all the canola fields that were in the county this year. That's all that we found oh, okay. this year. Yeah. So, so again, um, there are probably those fields that we didn't get to, didn't see, whatever the case may be, but those okay. are the ones that were inspected. Yeah. We're, we typically run right around 40,000 acres. Um, so, you know, if there's, you know, in any year between 700 to 800. So that that is a little bit low um, from yeah. what we typically see. Right? I was thinking but, it might have been a little low. Yeah. Trip, just why I asked. But. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's good. Thank you. So the next department report is for enforcement services on page 101. Can you Oh, Councillor Lewis. Thank you. I'm uh, just wondering what it says you participated in the virtual Papal visit, and I don't know what that is. And I probably pronounced it wrong. Sorry, if you could On point out the, the virtual. Uh, right there. Oh, uh, yeah, um, that was the when the Pope came. And um, so we uh, participated in an organizational uh, meeting prior to the event okay. taking place. So sorry uh, about the strange wording. That's yeah. okay. Uh, and then I just question on your, you were in mock court trials. What's, yes. what's that process and why, why do you participate? Um, we were contacted by the province, uh, actually one of our former colleagues. And uh, now that the uh, provincial government eliminated the, um, e-ticketing process where they were going to have no trials and so forth. Uh, they're proceeding with a slightly different model. And they're taking those people who, those adjudicators that would be normally um, having those discussions in a small office and they're trying to train them to be regular prosecutors. And because of our diversity and uh, the traffic enforcement here, we were contacted by them. And a few of our officers uh, provided um, testimony to help train those those people so we were honored to help them out with that yeah okay yeah. did we actually did you actually participate in papal security then or it was just no virtual? no this was a virtual sort of a slash ics uh okay. exercise if you will yeah thank you so the next department report is for engineering on page 110 Then moving forward to Family and Community Support Services on page 119. Followed by Fire Services on page 126. On page 135, we have a financial report for legislative. Next department is for Parks and Recreation on page 136. Um, just a question. Um, when do we close our campgrounds? Is it because I noticed there was 99 days of our comfort cabins, which is really the bulk of the summer. I mean, 100 good days in the summer. It's like, yay. But when do we actually close them down? I, and I should know that. I apologize, Mr. Honesty. No, and, and the, the 99 days is the two cabins, so each split. So um, Jubilee Campground is May long weekend till September long weekend. Okay. Uh, and then we do extend out our group campgrounds into the fall because we don't need the staffing resources as much. And Centennial Park is, is a contracted operator, right. so we do allow them to extend into the September season. Depends on the weather and demand. 
but uh, this year she was able to operate right through to the end of September. Absolutely, absolutely. So Would we ever consider longer season at, um, especially in the fall? Yeah, we have several times. Uh, the problem we face or the difficulties we face is with seasonal employees right. need to go back to school, need to go wherever they go. Right. And also that consistency of revenue. Obviously we commit to the expenses that come with it. Uh, and it you have a poor out. September, all right. of a sudden we've taken some big okay. losses. Uh, so when the sun's shining, like it does often these falls, there's high demand, but it's, it's whether we commit to the expenses that come with that, that we've never made that change um, to our operations. It seems prudent to just be disappointed that it's not open perhaps. <laughs> Sometimes, and we often refer to places that, that are if they're looking for That's that. Right. Okay, thank you. So the next department report is for planning and development on page 144. Then we have on page 154. Oh, hang on. Oh. Councilor, sorry, just nope. a question. I'm looking at page 148 at the bottom, the completion of a council's policy to guide the county's participation in the siting of new telecommunication towers. Can you remind me that policy? I haven't seen it. Um, Madam Chair, that hasn't come forward yet, so you haven't seen any of that material yet, but essentially what it is is a, no is a policy. So we, as telecommunication towers are proposed by private industry, essentially, um, they are regulated by the federal government, right? And what the municipality's role in that process is, is to either concur or not occur with a site that's been um, targeted by the service provider. And the manner in which we do that involves some public engagement and the policy is intended to, to guide that process. So this is not approved? No, it's not in place Okay, yet. sorry, I read it that we did and I couldn't remember, couldn't remember even... <laughs> talking about we've it. started some internal work on it madam chair but it hasn't come to you yet thank you so the next report is a financial report for public transit on page 154 of your package and then moving into the department report on page 156 for road operations Then we move into utilities on page 165. So we have under utilities, we have water distribution, wastewater collection, as well as waste management. Then the- just if, if I may, just back to road operations, um, and it's really not on this report, but we are starting graveling today. You did send out an email and we're up and running, Mr. Brubbett. That is great to be starting early. Are the roads be able to, nothing's frozen yet. So are we okay? Yep. Yeah, this is, yeah, you bet. This is Q3 report, but yes, we are graveling this morning. It started this morning. We've already done one pass and, and we're in really good shape. This little bit of moisture, it was timed perfectly. So dust is being, and, dust is minimal. And I hear it's going to freeze up pretty good in the next it's few days. It's going to tighten so. up quick. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Just, I knew it wasn't the part of that, but I knew you'd have the answer. Thank you. All right, and then moving to the other items on the table of contents, we have fiscal services and requisition expenditures on pages 175 and 177 of the report. All right, so then moving into our major and capital project plans, we'll go to page 179, which is the major project plan. So we have a summary that shows the projects that are still work in progress and the ones that are completed. So when we go to the next page, we go into the detailed projects. So on um, this page, it just speaks to the various status and provides a status update on the project uh, for each major project that is occurring in 2022. Are there any questions on any of the initiatives in 2022 on this plan? Questions? Seeing okay. none. All right. So then moving on to the capital plan, same summary before the capital project plan, just breaking down what's completed versus what's work in progress. And then going to the next page in the package, we go to the detail 
um, listing of all of the projects that had been approved for 2022, as well as providing a status update. Um, and then, you know, a status in terms of where things are in terms of being complete or work in progress. We will look to the road and bridge program specifically, but are there any questions on any of the other projects that um, are happening within the capital project plan? Just a general question. I know we have seen significant inflationary costs uh, coupled with um, supply chain issues. Are we anticipating that to be exasperated in this next budget coming forward, or do we have any way of knowing? I think that, you know, there is, I guess, a volatility with uh, pricing that we're, we're trying to adjust for, but unfortunately, it isn't an exact science that we can um, completely estimate what, what that impact will be. I think that, you know, we're looking to our experience and what has occurred in the last two years to inform what we put in for budget for 2023. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. So we've been receiving, you know, like mowers and truck boxes and graders and whatever that we've been <laughs> budgeted and bought. They've actually been coming in. They've been showing up. Uh, not all of a sudden, none available or anything. So, I mean, if you look at the one um, grader replacement project, when we look at that anticipated delivery is in Q1 of 2023. So it is there is a delay, so we will be doing a carry forward for those two graders um, to actually receive the graders in early 2023. So there, there is delay to receiving of equipment. But if that was anticipated, I just see there's some that was going to be now. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, some of them say they're completed, but uh, just wondering if there's a problem getting this stuff. So if the project is completed, that would require it being received. Thank you. So if there's no questions on the capital project plan, I'll move to the bridge program specifically. So we have provided some update here and a lot of the work on the bridge program is expected to be completed in Q4. See no questions on the bridge program. We go to the next page in the report on page 186. And this is a detailed listing of the road program. So again, a status update has been provided. Go ahead. No, no, sorry. Uh, the line uh, painting and stuff, uh, is that finished or uh, I just... <laughs> it's kind of funny you drive into Thorsby now and we've got that repair job we did on the bridge. It looks beautiful uh, going into on uh, 490, uh, 492, I guess it is. Uh, and it's got nice new lines on it and there's no lines on the road from Highway 39 all the way to Thorsby except for across the bridge. So I was just wondering, are we complete or with line painting? Or? Yeah, our line, our line painting contractor completed over the weekend, um, but I will look into that one in particular. It just it, yeah, it looks a little yeah strange to have lines across the bridge and nothing on the rest of the mile of road. So, okay. bridge contractor would have done it beautifully, but if that the road they don't do right. So, but uh, yeah, I'll look into that four ninety two. I'll look into whether that was on our priority list or not. The line markings are still there and distinct, though. On, on the rest of the road? Yeah. No. Not at all. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further questions, I'll move to the uh, final two schedules within the quarterly reporting package. We have on page 187, we have an operating reserve schedule. So we have um, a balance of just under 25 million in our operating fund reserve schedule. And then within our capital fund reserve schedule, we have just over 22 million. 
Councillor Smith. I'll wait. <laughs> okay. So that concludes uh, the review of all of the reports. So I welcome any questions from Council. Councillor Smith. Thank you for that. Again, you're looking for a recommendation today that we accept the report and attachments as information. Thank you. Um, just to comment, these reports, um, when you first brought them on, they were exceptional. I know it was a lot of work and I look at the staff members that are here. I'm always mindful of what we ask our staff to do and what council funds. I'm just wondering, with these being so well put together, so informative, and of course our CEO is generally overseeing most of this, I'm not seeing the reds and yellows that used to be on these reports. Thank you for making those disappear. I'm just wondering and throwing it out, do we need to do this every three months or could it be done every four months in a way of saving some of our staff time? Just again, I wish there was more money for more staff, but there's not. And sometimes maybe asking staff to do a little bit less than having maybe an hour or two to do something else. Just throwing it out there asking, do we need these every three months or every four in the name of, uh, I guess, staff resources? Thank you. Mr. Coleman. Um, Madam Chair, members of council, this, this is the work I expect from our directors. This is the accountability I expect and demand. Uh, I'm perfectly happy with the timeframes and the work that they do. Uh, this is important. This is a transparency yeah. piece. Uh, these folks work hard. I won't take that away from them. They work very hard. And at times we challenge them with multiple priorities. Uh, lots happening, but it is their work. It is the work that matters, the work that moves this organization cohesively forward. And so uh, we appreciate the time and ability to present it to you. And we appreciate the fact that you trust us and that your questions are limited. Uh, it, I mean, that tells me we're doing our job. And so uh, if it appears like we go through this quickly, uh, that, that we don't see that as, as a sign of non-interest or disrespect. We see that as a valued piece of trust that we have earned and will continue to earn as your administration. Yep, go ahead, Councillor Smith. And again, a follow up. These aren't only for us, they are public documents. And my residents have commented when there's questions how clear everything is and where the dollars are going and where the progress is. So, again, I will take that explanation that you're comfortable with every three months. Thank you. Just um, on that as well, I think that since we started to do the quarterly reports, Council is much more in tune with what's happening. Uh, we get the information at the same time. We discuss it at the same time. Um, and it means that when we move into budget, we're linking back and forth all the time. And so I think it's created a stronger and more informed council. Um, and I really do appreciate it. That, and I appreciate your comments and look forward to the next one in the next quarter. And did you make a motion then to move forward? Yeah, yes, you did. Okay, thank you for that. Any further comments or questions? If not, I will call the question. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And girls. I, I meant guys in a gender neutral sort of way. Mm -hmm. Today's the day we don't require. Yeah, today, but there's a fire ban. Did it? Yeah, today's, today's freedom. But you, so I called Brad and I said, wait, are you still on? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I told Josh and Pat Allen, well, you got Matt Allen. Okay, oh, we're yeah. still working here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, on to Mr. Coleman's item, which is our last item before lunch. And we never want to take too much time before lunch. So 7B, live streaming of council meetings. The floor is yours, Mr. Coleman. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Gavin. She did the report, so she deserves I the credit Ms. for Gavin. it. Thank you, Council. This is a follow-up to the motion that was made on November 21st, 2021 at the Governance and Priorities Committee for the live streaming, um, live virtual meetings as a tool to assist council in communicating with rate payers. And it was approved and to be have a one-year review period. The one-year review period is now complete and we have completed a summary of results since November, 2021. Um, IT provided some statistics. The average number of viewers during the live stream, live stream event is between three and five viewers. The average number of viewers of the recorded event on YouTube after the live stream is between 26 and 87 viewers. And it's important to note that the number of viewers mentioned above does not differentiate 
if an internal staff member or resident views a live stream. The number of support hours IT time to set up and support the event is 80 hours over the past year, $5,000 equated to staff time. We have had one IT staff member present all live stream events to date. There are no other costs associated um, other than the time resource required to set up and maintain the live stream. The utilization of Microsoft Teams and YouTube uses technology that already exists in the county for other purpose. I also did a poll of other municip municipalities through the AMCA Association, which is Alberta Municipal Clerks Associations. I also sent an email to surrounding municipalities in the region and the majority responded their municipality will continue the live streaming of council and committee meetings. Um, if should council decide to continue live streaming regular and governance and priorities meetings, and in order to make the process smoother when moving between public and in-camera agenda items, administration will look at find, finding a solution through our agenda management implementation project, and that will be a cost associated. But administration right now is um, recommending that Ladue County continue broadcasting live recording and posting on the website all regular council and governance and priorities committee meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Um, the average views recorded between 26 and 87, that's across the year. Is that correct? So there's been 87 hits on uh, all the meetings across the year. Or yeah, okay. The uh, numbers differentiate between each meeting, right? So one meeting could have 27 views right. and then the next meeting could have 87. Absolutely. Okay, Councillor Lewis and then Councillor Smith. Thank you. As a supporter of this uh, a year ago, I would continue to advocate that we uh, continue to broadcast our meetings for transparency as we were just talking about in our last piece to our residents. Uh, as many times as I can, I push for our residents to to view our meetings and our council meetings and and view our, the work that we do for the people that they elected. So I would continue Thank to support. You. Councillor Smith. I have to say I was somewhat skeptical that we would even get much of views, and I know I was lukewarm whether we should bother with it and gave it a year. I'm really surprised of the numbers that are watching it after the fact. Maybe when they come home. And there's a question whether it's staff members. I'm sure our staff members have other things to do than watch the watch them after hours. I'm sure there are a few. So I, again, didn't really like it. I wanted to give it a chance, but I'm looking at the statistics. I'm looking at what other people are doing. And I have to agree with Councillor Lewis that transparency in today's world, people want to know exactly what's going on. So I will continue to support it if there's a motion to go forward with it today. Thank you. Councillor Scobie, do you have your, your microphones on? I don't know if you're... Oh. Well, I'll, yeah, I'll comment on it then. No, I'm surprised. I uh, When I seen the three to five viewers, I was thinking that's probably what we were expecting. But then when you see the ones on, you know, looking at it, uh, watching it on YouTube afterwards, to have numbers that high, uh, that surprises me quite, uh, uh, quite a bit. So uh, it's being used a lot more than I thought it would be. So uh, I guess I would support the carrying on with okay. it. Okay. Uh, did you want to make that motion then, Councillor Scobie? And then we can just get right into debate that Ladue County continue to broadcast live recording, posting of the website. How long do we keep the postings, Ms. Gavin or Mr. Uh, uh, Podlowski? How long do we, do we are they forever? Uh, currently it's indefinitely. But we can put process around that. Is that up in the cloud? It's hosted on YouTube. Yes, on our on our channel through okay. YouTube. That's interesting. I wonder if there needs to be a records management piece around that. Oh, I'm seeing a yes. Go ahead. So, if the decision of council today is to move forward, then I do believe administration has to develop some processes around how we would handle this. Given that this was a pilot project, we haven't um, had those conversations as of yet. And the policy committee would love to hear that and be part of those discussions. Um, I was uh, reluctant as well. Um, what I what I do see is that it's not extra work and it's not extra money, which was um, important. Um, as Councillor Smith uh, sort of uh, intimated at earlier, we are asking staff to do more, and um, this doesn't seem to be onerous. So I would be supporting the motion. 
Okay. Any further comments or questions? I am seeing none. I'm going to call the question. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Um, Mr. Coleman, we could go in camera and probably do 9BI or council. We probably could. We have 15 minutes. Um, I guess it's council's decision. Would you like to do that? I'm seeing some thumbs up. So I will ask for someone to move us into in camera. Councillor Belazer, all in favor? That is unanimous. And I will wait until we are in camera and then we will look at. We're ready. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for joining us. We are back um, in public meeting. The only uh, motion made in the in-camera session was to come out of camera, but we do have a number of um, uh, we have a number of we have some business coming out of the in-camera session and a number of motions. First one is when related to um, our appointment to public's, uh, public members at large, the Intermunicipal Subdivision and Development Appeal Board. And I believe that is on the yep, up it's there. on the screen, Madam Chair. So yep. Regional Assessment Review Board and Intermunicipal Subdivision Development Appeal Board appointments. Okay, are we going to make them at the same time? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. Someone want to make those motions? Councillor Smith, would you like to read out the names for both, if you could, please? That the following public members at large be appointed to the following quasi-judicial boards as follows. The Regional Assessment Review Board would be Gerd Anders and Ivina Peeve. And number two, the Intermunicipal Subdivision and Development Appeal Board would be Gerd Anders and Ricky Thomas. Any discussion, further discussion on that? I am seeing none. I'll call the question. All in favor? That is unanimous. Uh, we also had an opportunity uh, to look at um, regional initiatives. We have no motions coming out of that. 9C county manager evaluation. We do have a motion. I wrote it down, which but I might read on if I read it, um, because it talks about what the mayor's been. Oh, right. <laughs> sure. Just. Yeah, if you can, I can Let's see if I can it. audit this. Lydia County Council authorized the mayor to sign an amending agreement to extend the employment term of the CAO by three years to September 10th, 2027. Is, yeah. Yes, I, I just, uh, we are also um, including a performance bonus. Does that need to be in the motion as well? We weren't sure. We're all new. <laughs> no, it doesn't, Madam Chair. Okay. You can Thank you. give a memo to HR and yes, right. it's done. Um, so as Ms. Gavin is typing that out, again, um, so, uh, a little bit of a public thank you to our CAO. Um, has been working hard in our, in our region and in our county, um, has developed great relationships with not only um, our residents and our employees, but also uh, become a, a regional leader in the CAO's uh, great to work with, always has the county's best interests at heart, and we greatly appreciate that, um, and we enjoy uh, working with you. Yep. While we're preparing again, um, I'm, I'm happy that council has gone through and passed this motion today. One of the biggest risks we have at Ladue County right now would be to lose our CAO, who has driven so many changes and so many improvements to our organization. Um, so I'm looking forward to that work to continue. And by the looks of it, um, the CAO will be in seat uh, for two years of the next council, which gives them a chance to 
to get their feet under them and get going. And I'm sure they'll come to the same uh, conclusions we have about just the strength of Duane to Ladue County and, and where we are today. And again, being a counselor, I'm really proud of what admin has done and what council has done over the last nine years. Uh, it's hard to go home and look at the hundred things I used to shake my head over, which have now been fixed and the files are down to almost nothing. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your support. So we have a motion on the floor. Any other comments, debate? I'm happy to make. Oh, I thought you read it in on me. Oh, it's not typed out yet. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Your name is there. If you could read it out sure. one more time. Sure, that Leduc County Council authorized the mayor to sign an amending agreement to extend the employment contract, employment term of the CAO, the county manager, by three years to September 10th, 2027. Okay. All in favor? That is unanimous. Looking forward to that. And I will adjourn us at uh, 2.07. Thank you. <laughs>